Well, this is a picture of the Oski girls volleyball team that went to state this past week. This was the picture when they beat Pella to get to state. <laughs> now hold on. Look at the jubilation. You don't rehearse that. You don't, right? Have you ever been that in your life where you're just like, woo! I have a feeling that this is a bit like heaven. We have a lot of pressure on us to succeed. We have a lot of pressure to succeed and do well in life, right? Just like in a game of life. And when you win, woo! Pressure's off. You win the game. Wow. All you can say is, wow. Heaven, have you ever imagined what it would be like? Pure joy, no pressure, no sin to wrestle with. You know, it's really difficult for our finite minds to comprehend that. It's almost as if we need struggle in this life to know what good is. in our humanity. It's difficult on this earth, this side of heaven, to fully comprehend what it will be like. Well, today we're gonna see the imagery in chapters four and five of Revelation of what the Apostle John sees in his vision of what heaven is gonna be like. Now, it's complex in interpreting, and some of the things I'm gonna to share today are our thoughts of what scholars would say, we don't know for sure. Obviously, it's a vision of what is to come, but we're going to see him describe it. Earl Palmer writes about the context in which Revelation was written. Remember, these are real people, real time, real things happening in their life, and they're experiencing a tremendous amount of difficulty. John, who was in prison on Patmos, you can see the island there, he writes these letters to the churches in Ephesus and churches that surround it. His goal is to comfort and encourage them because they are being persecuted. Letters are probably written around 60s A.D., shortly before the fall of Jerusalem. And in 64 A.D., when the great fire of Rome occurred, which the Roman historian Tactus believed was started by Nero, the emperor at the time, since he had dreams of being an architect and redesigning the city, the fire was set in a slum area, and he wanted to burn it down. But the fire spread throughout the whole city, and Nero blamed the Christians for it. He called them arsonists and blamed them for the fire, which wasn't true. They were being persecuted, murdered, because of their belief in Jesus. And these churches here were wondering, how is this going to affect us? Our lives could be in danger for our belief. How are we supposed to live with that pressure? The book of Revelation today will address those questions. If you would please turn in the Bible uh, in, before you in one of the seats, turn back to Revelation 4 and 5. If you're unfamiliar with what Revelation is, it is the final book in the Bible way at the end. I'm going to be reading a lot of Scripture again and stopping and going back and forth and explaining this vision from John. And so I encourage you to have that out. Just a couple of facts again as we get started. The Apostle John wrote the book of Revelation. Visions granted to John by God. It can be confusing, and today can be confusing as well because of the literary style that's used. And the book is ultimately, though, friends, it's about hope. About the hope that we have in Christ. Today, John will see a vision of heaven that encouraged the believers then and us today to keep going and to persevere. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word to us today. Thank you for moments of worship that draw us to your heavenly throne. And so, Father, as we read your word today, may your spirit guide us, teach us, encourage us that all that is said and all that is thought is for the glory of Jesus. In whose name we pray, amen. 
Revelation 4. Okay, I'm going to start in Revelation 4. I'm going to stop a little bit, move on to Revelation 5. So if you hang with me, there's going to be interesting, interesting things for us to see through this. The Apostle John writes this. After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. That's verse 1. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what may take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it, and the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby or carnelian, a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These were the seven spirits of God. And also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. Now hold on, we're going to stop right there. I want to, scholars say, what possibly this imagery could mean, okay? Again, these are plausible explanations. It's a vision, so we do our best of interpreting, but it also makes sense in the broader scope of Scripture. One author said this, he says, the throne, if you look at throne, it's mentioned 14 times in this chapter alone. It is mentioned 46 times throughout the book of Revelation. Meaning, no matter what happens on this earth, there is a God in heaven, seated, who is in ultimate control of all things. He is seated on the throne as a king, in ultimate control of the things that are to follow. As we read later on in this sermon series, as we go farther, we're going to see a lot of things that are very difficult. But this is a reminder that no matter what happens, God is in control. Now, jasper, which is mentioned, is a bright color. It's translucent, more like a diamond. And that could represent, could possibly represent the perfection of God. Now, the carnelian, or the ruby color, it's a fiery red color. Jasper and carnelian were the first and last stones on the breastplate. That's why that picture is up there. The first and last stones on the breastplate of the high priest of the tribes of Israel. Possibly could mean this continual covenant, covenant that God has with his people. That God is the beginning of time, he is in time now, and he is into the future as well. Now, emerald green, it dominates the rainbow, so rainbow equals God's faithfulness, as we remember in Noah, right? There's a rainbow to say that God was faithful, but it's a complete circle now in heaven. If you look at it in the text, it's a complete circle. What does that mean? In heaven, all things are completed. The elders that are seated there also represent, could represent the church as the church gathers to worship. Possible explanations of what John was witnessing, but it also connects to scripture of the Old and New Testaments. Let's continue in verse six in Revelation four. In the center around the throne were four living creatures and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second was like an ox, the third had a face like a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night they never stopped saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever, and they lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. I'm going to stop briefly there. Just take a look at the slides up here again. Possible interpretation of the lion. 
Oh, we've got that next slide there. Here we go. A possible interpretation of the lion signifying strength, the ox, humble service, man, the rational being, and the eagle, the swiftness of service. Amazing. And in all of these things, they are acknowledging the one true God. The things that we might exalt in this world, they are now exalting God in heaven. That when we want strength of this world, now we're going to say, no, there is one who is stronger. One who is the ultimate servant. The one who is the ultimate learned one. The one who serves. All that is said is to honor the one on the throne. John sees this vision of God in heaven and we see what he has to say next. We continue in chapter five. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll. But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look, in, look inside it. I wept and I wept because no one was found was worthy to open the scroll or to look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne, and when he had taken it, the four living creatures and 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song, saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals, because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard a voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, to be praise and honor and glory and power forever ever and ever, and the four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshiped. Amen. In verse two, we see that Jesus is the only one that is worthy to open the scrolls, these scrolls. Now, what does that mean? These scrolls reveal the plan for the future, what's going to unfold before the people. Jesus is the only one that can do that. In our pluralistic world today, friends, we acknowledge here in Scripture, Jesus is the only one that will open the scrolls. He's the only one that will unfold this plan for the future. And we see in the text that John was upset. He was even weeping because he didn't think anyone was worthy to open these scrolls. But we're reminded in the vision that Jesus is able Jesus has the authority to control what is to come. Another picture here of uh, Gustave Dor's Empyrean, which means sublime or celestial sphere. This picture of the angels worshiping. Worship means to ascribe to ascribe worth to, to grant worth to, and honor to. We see this picture in Revelation of heaven is a glorious place where we will worship Jesus forever. Now we all have different ideas of what heaven will be like. Some people say, yeah, I've got a loved one who's down looking down us right now, or someone's playing a harp or something, and, and then some people are like, well, I don't wanna sing all day. I don't wanna do that. Right? Everybody's got their own kind of idea of what heaven's going to be like. But what we see, the main activity that will take place, friends, is worship. 
granting worth to, ascribing to, and whether you like music or not, you're not gonna worry about it. You don't complain in heaven. You're gonna be free. I don't think we can even comprehend how it will be when we are in the presence of the Almighty. We also see there's unity and there's diversity that God saves every tribe, tongue, and nation of those who love him. Heaven is theocentric, God-centered. Jesus will be at the center. It won't worry about what our likes or dislikes are gonna be. It won't matter. There will be people from every tribe and every nation. Our main activity will be worship. There will be no more pain, no more suffering. It is so hard to comprehend, but it is so motivating to hear it. And friends, when we gather together as worshipers, we are reminded that we do not sit on the throne of our lives. As much as we desire to be the center of our universe here in this earth because of our sin and selfishness, we are reminded today through John's vision that there is one throne for eternity and the sooner we figure that out, the better our life's gonna be. Maybe we need to live more with the end in mind than what we may be currently living. How are we to spend our time now preparing for this moment of seeing Jesus? Are we worried or distracted about things in this life that are rather insignificant? Jesus states in Matthew 6, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes, where neither thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I talked to someone a week ago about things that were happening in their job, and there's just a lot of kind of complaining going on. And he said, you know, he says, I wish sometimes that people would just care a little less. Think about it. What do we get so wrapped up about? Don't worry about it. What are the things you're worrying about right now about your job or family, whatever, where you could just say, you know what, do I really need to worry about that? You see, another way to say that is this. Keep life in perspective. This isn't all that there's gonna be. Don't sweat the small stuff. If we live with the end in mind or a new beginning in mind, maybe we would keep better perspective on how we live now. Maybe have a little less stress and experience a little more love and kindness. Maybe we gather as a body to remind ourselves, friends, that this earthly life is temporary. My father-in-law who we adore um, isn't doing well. He's been battling cancer for five years and he's in the hospital in Des Moines right now. And you know when I think about his life, I think about the way he loves his grandchildren and his children. And it's amazing, I've known him for about 26 years now. And it's just, it's hard to see him suffer. But when we read this text, he loves Jesus we will miss him here. Now we don't know how long he has. He could just be struggling with an infection again, but we love him. But friends, each one of us, each one of you knows someone who struggled or you even lost a loved one, and it hurts. But we gather, friends, to remind ourselves that this earthly life is temporary no matter how much time we have with our loved ones here. So let's spend time doing the things that are important. C.S. Lewis wrote this, he says, aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you will get neither.
Are we thinking about the treasures in heaven? Or are we so distracted here that we're really not getting either? So what from the picture that John envisions heaven to be, what are you looking forward to? We've learned two things that are terribly important in this chapter, four and five. We learned that the goodness of creation, the images of creation of completeness, and that God hasn't left us alone. In the crisis of our brokenness and our sin and our shame, it has not destroyed God's first decision to create and then to save. He ransomed us, he made us, he sustains us, and we will see him again. Every tribe, every tongue, every group of people that believe in him are sons and daughters of the kingdom. Therefore, now, since we are so beloved, friends, why do we worry so much? Why are we afraid? There's a story from E. Stanley Jones I'd like to share. He's a great evangelist in the last century. He was telling a story of a little boy who created a sailboat. He made a sailboat, and he placed it um, in the Central Park Lake in New York City. When he put the boat into Central Park Lake, it was catching a lot of wind, and it suddenly got away from him. And so the boat sailed way across, and he, he lost his boat. It's really kind of a sad story. A little boy created this, this beautiful boat, and now it sailed away. A couple of day, days later, he was walking on 57th Street, and he saw his boat in a window at a pawn shop. There was his boat. It obviously had gone to the other side of the lake. Somebody found it. They sold it. And when he saw it, he went to the pawn shop person right away. He says, hey, I, I would need to buy that boat. And he says, well, it costs this much. And he says, well, uh, don't sell it. I'll be right back. So he went home and got his money from his allowance and the earnings that he made, and he came back to the pawn shop, and he bought the boat back. According to E. Stanley Jones, as the boy left the pawn shop, he said this. He said, little boat, you were mine for two reasons. I made you and I bought you. That's the chapter four and five of Revelation. The God of creation who made you and me, he also bought us back from the hell in which we deserved. He endured the cross so we would not. We will worship our risen Savior freely someday, and we can't even fathom how good that is gonna be but it ought to leave us with a sense of awe and wonder, a spontaneous praise. Friends, we can't fathom how good it's gonna be. We will be in the presence of the holy, spontaneous joy. I spoke of pulling back the curtain the first Sunday. I, uh, we started this series, and also the box. Remember, apocalypse means to reveal that the lid comes off, you get to see what's really there, or the curtain is pulled back, you get to see what's really taking place. The Apostle John describes for us what is real. What is behind the curtain is glorious. It is God-focused, for he is worthy of that focus. So may we live with this glorious ending and new beginning in mind. If this is a picture of what is to come, what we endure now cannot compare to the future. Spend our life focused, friends, on what's important. Aim for heaven and you get earth thrown in. Dwell more on how we will love and serve others. How can God be glorified through our daily activities? May we live as if we are not on the throne of our lives, but that Jesus is. I'd like to end with this story about, from a member, uh, Michelle DeHaan, a member from Central. She shared this about her grandfather. And Michelle said this. My grandpa passed away on August 4, 2019, 
and it was a rather unexpected passing as he hadn't been sick and was still living independently. In fact, eight days before he passed, he had been sitting in my living room joyfully celebrating our oldest daughter's 13th birthday. He drove himself to the hospital a week before his passing because of some chest discomfort and the discovery of blocked arteries sent him to Des Moines for several procedures and ultimately, they were unsuccessful. After the last procedure, the doctors called the family to his bedside as they knew his time on this earth was drawing to an end. All of his children and their spouses and several grandchildren were able to be by his side during his last hours on earth. As he was drifting towards heaven, he closed his eyes, resting in his family's love. Suddenly, he opened his eyes, looked off into something beyond the hospital room, something that cannot be seen on this side of heaven and uttered an audible, wow. His eyes closed again, and he peacefully breathed his last. In the book of Revelation, chapters 4 and 5, they are a wow moment for those who believe. Friends, may those words encourage us as John was writing to encourage the churches who were persecuted. May those words encourage us today to live with the end in mind, that we aim for heaven and we get a meaningful time on this earth no matter how long that is. May we focus on what is important, love and serve others well. May we repent of our sin and live for the king, because heaven awaits. Let's pray. Father, thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you that your spirit that helped John write these words is the same spirit that is with us today. And Father, I pray for those in this room right now who might be struggling with with suffering or pain or knowing of one or a loved one who is. Father, we, we look to your word and we're reminded that this place is not our home. We are simply passing through. But Father, may we make these moments as we pass through. May they be lived for you. May others be drawn to you because of the love and the words shared, that your spirit would convict others and that we would follow you wholeheartedly. Jesus, you are so good to us. You are seated on the throne. If we're seated on the throne today of our lives, Father, will you just knock us off of it? May we rightfully see who we are in your eyes. We are beloved children. God, thank you for this church body where we gather and we worship and we're just, we're just practicing for what's to come. Thank you, Father, for your great love. Receive our honor and praise and glory for you are due all of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.